so good to see everybody again. Okay, and we're also live now on uh, YouTube, or the stream's just, the, the stream takes, a, it's about 20 second delay on it, so the YouTube will be up here in a second. Um, mm -hmm. welcome, to, welcome to everyone from, from you, YouTube as well. Thanks for <coughs> in there. Also, if you're on YouTube, it might be worth noting that we have, um, or even if, you're, even if you're in Zoom, if you want to go check out YouTube, we also have a sort of a collection of uh, yeah, talks from the department. On, uh, YouTube, or the stream's just, the, the stream takes oh, a sorry. 20 second delay on it, so the YouTube sorry, that's an echo. Welcome, welcome to everyone from, from the... <laughs> yeah, well, there, 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 there you go. That's the uh, delay on Zoom right there. Hold on, let me mute everything. Oh, anyway, that, as I was saying... Lovely um, comment there from Susanna. Oh, sorry, I demuted. Thank you, Susanna. Oh, hi, Susanna. Yes, that's great. Uh, great. I like the format very much, having you panelists and all the others. This is a real improvement over other online formats. Well, thank you. Um, and hey, thanks, uh, Martin, for arriving. Uh, we're just waiting on the, um, we're just waiting on the um, closed captioning, but I suppose, worst case scenario, we'll just activate the live closed captioning and get rolling. And if they come in, we can activate them. She's, she's on her way. She, okay. she just sent an email. Great, great, great. Virtually, you mean on her way? <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't have language for this. <laughs> just jumping in her car and driving around, you know. Yeah. Well, I guess before I forget, I'll. Uh... Just while we give a couple more minutes here for both the interpreter, oh, um, for, sorry, for the transcriber to show up, I'll just also share. Hey, Katie Ryder is her name. Yeah, Katie. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's run that for a second. Actually, as I was saying, I think I, I maybe I kind of interrupted myself on the YouTube delay. If you head over to the YouTube channel, you'll also see that we're starting to collect up uh, talks from across the department and Get people's talks from other sites so you know from Aberlin or from these other um, um, well and from and from University of Birmingham for that matter um, inaugural lectures and things like that as well as uh, taster lectures and and various things so those we're trying to kind of consolidate them all on the um, um, on the uh, on, on this new YouTube channel so if you're interested in the research being done in the department um, there's lots of talks there uh, we'll keep adding to that it's a bit of a a bit patchy coverage at this moment but we'll get that um, We'll, we'll keep adding to that as we go on. Uh, Jack? Yes. There was a question by Sergio, um, whether you could share the YouTube channel um, in the chat. Yes, yes. If the, if the YouTube channel chat gets going, I'm happy. I, I, I have access to it. I don't think we had any chat last week and maybe the week before. I realized there was some chat in the um, in, in the two previous weeks, especially uh, for, for Ted's talk that we never really got to. Um, there's some questions there. Um, yeah. If we have time, I'll definitely try to get those added into the um, into the mix too, although we always are leaving some questions behind, I'm, I'm afraid. But yeah, yeah, definitely I'll jump in there and uh, and, and share that if, if, if it's active. So the captioner has joined us. Welcome, Katie. Hi there. Hi, sorry I was a bit late. No problem. No problem. <laughs> Let me kill this and I will give you the captioning rights. Neil can't see the interpreter. Can we all switch off our videos again? Yeah, yeah, we can all switch off our video as well. You, 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 yeah, that'd be great. I'll, I'll leave mine on to do the introduction here. And let me just, um, okay, great. You should now have access to closed captioning. Great. Okay, I think we're good to start here. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, I really appreciate everyone coming back to this. This is our um, this is our fourth Birmingham lecture now in this um, series on language structure and language use. Um, and today we will have uh, Dagmar Diviak here from our own department, um, or and well, and from also the Modern Languages Department here in the department uh, here in Un University of Birmingham. Um, I think there's there's not really very many kind of technical um, notes. This week, um, the main one is, is that um, is that the live stream to YouTube 
Uh, like like last week, we'll 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 just have Dagmar. If you would like um, BSL interpretation or the professional captioning, uh, professional captioning. I, I think there might be a bomber in the messages. I'll come back to that in a sec. Um, if you'd like the um, if you like uh, professional captioning or um, BSL interpretation, then please do come to Zoom. I've just tweeted the link out so you can you, you can go there. Um, otherwise, we will upload um, a, a BSL version up to YouTube, also for David's talk last week as well. Um, anyway, um, my name is Jack Reeve. Um, I'm the host here as usual. I'm a professor of corpus linguistics here in the department. Um, and otherwise, I'll just run through the, um, the panelists here quickly, um, starting with David, who's first on my screen. So we had David last week. Um, who came from Queen Mary University. Uh, we are joined this week by Peter Millen, who is um, Dagmar's colleague and, and, and co-director of, uh, of, of the research group, which has generated the research we'll talk about today. So he's here at University of Birmingham. Uh, of course, we always welcome our, our BSL interpreters. We have Adam Shembry here from our department. Um, we have Adele Goldberg, who was our second speaker from Princeton, uh, Jeanette Littlemore from our department, uh, Bodo Winter from our department, uh, and then we're also joined by both Ted Gibson, who was our first speaker from MIT, um, and Martin Haspelmath, who um, is at Max Planck and will be joining us next week for our final talk. I'll uh, note that at the end of the event. We also have um, transcription here from clear text as well. Um, otherwise, I'd just like to introduce Dagmar and, and pass the floor over to her. Um, you know, it's really my pleasure to introduce Dagmar because uh, she's both my colleague and my friend, um, and she's a member here of our department. Uh, she's a professor, prof, professorial research fellow in cognitive linguistics and language cognition, and she heads up the Out of Our Minds or the Uminds uh, research yeah. group here at Birmingham, along with uh, Peter, who's joining us today as a special guest. Um, and really, I think the goal there is to basically to sort of develop cognitive models about how people learn and represent linguistic knowledge, um, taking a computational approach often. Um, she is also notably the editor in chief of the Journal of Cognitive Linguistics um, and has published widely herself in linguistics. I think maybe most notably, or at least most recently, including her 2019 book with Cambridge University Press called Frequency and Language, Memory, Attention and Learning. Um, and today she will talk to us about what can be learned from usage, which sounds like a perfect topic for this series. Uh, thank you very much, Dagbar. Um, you can share, share your screen. Um, and I think it's just me now. I'll turn off my camera. Thank you. Okay. Tell me, Jack, whether you can see the right thing. Yes, that's all great. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, first of all, thanks so much for organizing this series. I've really enjoyed the previous talks and also for inviting me or rather us to be the local representative. So in keeping with your rock theme, I've brought a band. They are somewhere in the audience and they will be happy to take any questions you have while um, I try and explain what we've been doing so far. So um, usage-based linguistics is built on the assumption that languages are dynamic systems that emer emerge from and are shaped by usage. And that process is mediated by general cognitive abilities and by functional considerations. So the cognitive abilities that have received most attention to date are classification, generalization and abstraction and imagination in the form of metaphor and metonymy. Cognitive constructs have received some attention too, although not always as much as would have been accepted and uh, expected. So examples here are memory and attention. Take memory, for example, which isn't widely discussed um, in usage-based approaches, even though frequency plays a crucial role in usage-based approaches and frequency effects are in essence memory effects. And what is really interesting is that despite our interest in the emergence of structure from use, processes or functions that would enable growing a system from use have been absent from usage-based considerations. <clears throat> in fact, I think that learning constitutes our very own elephant in the room. And learning was exiled from the linguistic landscape by Chomsky's criticism of Skinner's verbal behavior in the late 50s. And although recent years have seen a resurgence in the interest in learning, it's still to make a full comeback onto the linguistic scene. And this is all due to the review that Chomsky wrote of, of Skinner's work. It was shockingly beside the point. 
Skinner had been sent an earlier 60 page long version of the review that uh, Chomsky ultimately pub published in language, but he had stopped reading it six pages in because he could not make any sense of it. But it was amazingly efficient. When you compare, for example, prominent psychologists such as Broadband and Osgood also published reviews of Skinner's work and they published these reviews in reputable psychology journals, but they never achieved what Chomsky achieved with his review in language. Um, Knapp looked into detail, um, in, looked, looked into this in detail in 1992, and he um, <clears throat> established that between 1972 and 1990, the review of verbal behavior by Chomsky was cited once for every two citations of verbal behavior itself. And this is a very unusual relationship between a book and a review, and it's been said it's probably unique in the history of social sciences. Then in 2006, Nick Ellis was the first really to reintroduce concepts and measures from learning theory to the study of language learning and in particular second language learning. And he followed this through with a series of case studies that investigated typical learning effects such as blocking and overshadowing in second language learning. For L1, the, for L1 acquisition, the trend was set by Ramskar and Jarlet in 2007 with a case study on regular and irregular plurals in English. But um, I didn't get interested in learning because I was interested in language learning, weirdly enough. I got interested in learning for a different reason. I was looking for a way to ensure the cognitive reality of the categories and labels that I was working with. So as a cognitive corpus linguist, the real question for me was and still is knowing whether the patterns I find in the data are real. And with real, I don't mean do they exist in the data because sure they do, we found them. With real, I mean, are they also real for naive native speakers who are untrained linguists? So what I really want to know is which regularities that you can detect in the data are really discovered and exploited by native speakers. What do these patterns look like? Do they look like the patterns I, as a linguist, am looking for, or are they completely different? And another question is, do we really need, need to make sense of these patterns? That is, do we need to interpret them and label them semantically? Is that something that native speakers also do? So these are some of the questions that bug me and that I will be talking about today in this presentation. So one way for me to get a handle on this was via the concept of learning. Now, linguists are, in a sense, interested in the end result of learning. And we like our knowledge neatly organized, as in this tool cabinet, which has a space for phonemes and morphemes and lexemes and constructions, you name it, it's, it's there. Psychologists, on the other hand, are interested in the process of learning, how the rat learns to navigate the maze. And we think we can fruitfully combine these partial interests of psychology and linguistics because the process can help us understand the end result. If we let learning constrain the linguistic units and the generalizations that theory allows, we may have found a way to honor the cognitive commitment by which cognitive linguists are bound. And, if, and we can also let the end result um, help reverse engineer the process. So we can let the linguistic commitments inspire new insights into intricate aspects of learning, and we can help learning theorists who are interested in language determine what exactly needs to be learned to learn a language, because we're not just rats in a maze. So this is the research program we are pursuing with the Out of Our Minds team, which I lead together with Peter Millen. And our work has so far focused on what learning can tell us about language, that is, about how language works, and also on how data from language can challenge um, theories of learning. In the talk today, I will present some of the work we are doing on understanding aspects of the nominal and verbal system. And we factor learning in by using computational techniques that implement principles of learning. So this kind of approach, in our view, provides valuable insights into the kinds of generalizations or abstractions that can lay claim to cognitive plausibility, but it may ultimately also alter the way in which we think about language. So to summarize the aim of this talk in terms of structure and use, the topic of this series, I've borrowed and adapted David Adger's slide David spoke last week. 
So maybe the neat tool cabinet that I just showed looks more like a messy kitchen drawer. Um, I will be arguing that grammar may be more concrete than we think, and it's really important for us to stay faithful to the experience. If we do that, then abstractions may not look how we expect them to look. And this is something I will illustrate with a case study on allomorphine and Polish. And the dividing lines between the categories we acknowledge may not fall where we expect them to fall. And this is something I will illustrate with a case study on the tense aspect system in English. But before going there, I will show that models of learning really can do what we need them to do for them to be useful to usage-based linguists. I also want to put two disclaimers in. First of all, I'm not trying to do or aiming to do things as well as computationally possible. My interest is in doing things as cognitively plausible as possible because I'm a cognitive linguist. Linguists of different convictions and persuasions may have different concerns, such as economy of description, and those are equally valid. I'm also not trying to convert the world to learning, let alone trying to convince anyone that learning will solve all the problems of linguistics, because it won't. But I do feel that learning has something valuable to offer the usage-based community, because we do need to show how abstractions emerge, emerge from exposure to usage, and what cognitively realistic abstractions would look like. So let me first tell you a bit more about learning. The algorithm that we're using and that will be used in the case studies I will be presenting today is Riskorlein Wagner's model of cl classical conditioning. Harald Bayen and Peter Millen implemented this rule computationally in 2011 as MDL, the naive discriminative learner. Now, this model stands out because it is a number of things. It's simple, it's powerful, it explains a range of empirical learning phenomena, it's biologically plausible, and it also has an evolutionary advantage over other learning mechanisms that are more powerful, but also more costly and more greedy. If we are to summarize the Riscorla Wagner <clears throat> in two sentences, we can say that it is an error correction learning mechanism that defines how a system gradually learns to perform a task, not just from the positive or supportive evidence it receives, but also, and in particular, from the predict prediction errors that it makes. So by now, Harold Bayan's lab has produced quite a bit of evidence showing that error correction learning captures important aspects of morphological processing. Uh, studies in this line of research typically first train a Rescorla Wagner model on a large corpus of texts. Then they extract learning measures from the simulated model. And they use these measures to predict responses from an experimental task, such as, for example, lexical decision. Now, the first case study I will present has a different aim and takes a different approach. Uh, it aims to test how well the Rescorla Wagner model captures how individuals learn a pattern from exposure to usage. And we will train the model on the exact same data our participants receive for training, and we test it on the exact same items, items our participants are tested on. And showing that the Riscola Wagner model learns patterns from data the way humans do, in my opinion, constitutes a real test for the model and one that it needs to pass before it can be deployed as a model of language learning on a large scale within usage-based theories. So this is work done with our former postdoc, Dr. Adnan Ezizi. Adnan is in the audience today. So feel free to ask questions in the chat and he'll be answering them gladly. So how did the, the Santas shake their hats? That's the question for the first case study. On the 21st of October, 2013, Pani Marta sent a letter to the website Linguistic Dilemmas to ask which verb form to use when talking about Santa toys in the past tense. And you may think it's a silly question, but it isn't if you're a native speaker of Polish. At first sight, the rule looks simple. If the reference, the subjects are masculine personal, so men, then the past tense suffix on the verb is li, which is sometimes referred to as the masculine personal or the virile ending. But if the reference are anything else, masculine animate, masculine inanimate, fem feminine animate, feminine personal or neuter, 
then the past tense suffix on the verb is supposed to be we, which is sometimes referred to as the non-masculine personal or the non-feral ending. But things get really complicated when we want to refer to mixed groups. So prescriptive grammars and native speakers of Polish disagree as to what form should be assigned to a subject that includes multiple masculine animate references that are not persons, like the Santas, or mixes masculine animate and feminine personal reference, such as a girl and a dog. The grammar textbooks prescribe the use of we, while native speakers appear to favor the use of li. And in fact, an informal survey among Polish-speaking friends showed that they'd rather avoid the the situation altogether, and avoidance is always a good indication of a problem. So in our study, we set out to investigate whether learners would behave according to the rescorla wagner model, and we modeled how individual language learners engage with the task on a trial-by-trial -trial basis, and how they each compare with our virtual learner that was programmed to behave according to the rescorla wagner model. The task we ask them to perform is a simplified natural learning task in which they learn Polish sub subject verb agreement in the plural past tense through natural exposure to examples. So um, we had 66 participants and they were taught the Polish labels of the 12 different animal and human characters that were used in the learning task. Next, they were trained on different combinations of these 12 characters and the past tense form. So each event in our learning task consisted of a scene that represented a joint action performed by a group of human and or animal characters like the boy and the dog walking in the picture. And for each learning event, participants saw a picture that depicted the scene while they heard an audio recording of a Polish clause that described it. And each combination was presented 15 times. After the training, the participants moved to the testing phase. And overall in the test phase, they encountered 29 Q combinations in total, which were randomly selected from a total of 70 possible combinations. We then programmed a virtual ag agent to be an incarnation of the Escorla Wagner model. This virtual learner was trained on the same information as the participants saw, but presented in a more boring format, as you can see in the table. And the virtual learner was then tested on the exact same test questions as its um, part participants saw. So the Rescorla Wagner model has three parameters that can be adjusted. They're called alpha, beta, and lambda. And together they represent sensitivity to error, salience, and learning rate. They're usually left or set to their default values. But um, we wanted to mimic individual differences in learning. And for this reason, we adjusted the learning rate for each participant. And we set the learning rate in such a way that it would maximize the match rate between the predicted and the observed responses for each individual. Now, <clears throat> what were the results? So based on a simple decision strategy that for each event selected the verb form that had the highest activation, we obtained an average fit accuracy of 68%. So the model explained the verb form choices made by a large proportion of participants rather well. Um, there was quite a, a, a range of performance from 25% to the full 100%. And for 17 out of 63 participants, the agreement was higher than 80%, so very high. But for 9 out of 63, the agreement was below 50%. Now, um, the figure on the right-hand side shows two additional things. The left panel shows that the model's activation support for a form was significantly and positively associated with the likelihood of participants choosing this form. So in the lower left corner on the x-axis, you have forms that weren't supported by the model and you see on the y-axis that they weren't chosen either by the, by the participants. And conversely, in the right upper corner on the x-axis, you have forms that were strongly supported by the model and you see on the y-axis that they were frequently chosen by the participants too. So that's another um, good point for the Descorla Wagner model. The right panel on the um, graph shows that the slowest responses were recorded for the least supported events. So on the x-axis, you have activation support again, with no activation on the left and strong activation on the right. 
And on the y-axis, you see the response time latencies, which are lower and thus faster for forms that are either not at all or very strongly supported by the model. And they are higher or slower for forms where the model is uncertain. And human participants behaved in exactly the same way. We can also drill down a little deeper and look at the match rate between Rescorla Wagner and participants per type of animal and human character combination. And on the plot, you see the observed proportions. Those are the red dots and the predicted ones. Those are the blue squares of participants choosing a specific form given a certain Q combination. Um, they're sorted in ascending order, and you see that the dots and the squares track each other closely. So the model really managed to capture the difference in the levels of agreement between participants across the different types of subjects really very well. So overall, the model fit results demonstrate that Rescorla Wagner successfully accounts for the behavior of a large proportion of the participants, but recall that there was quite a bit of variation. Uh, with the fit ranging from 24% to 100% of matches. So finally, we also looked at some standard measures of individual variation. One was gender, the other one was working memory. And we found that having a larger working memory capacity or being female increased the likelihood of participants choosing verb forms in accordance with the Rescorla Wagner model in our language learning task. So the takeaway message is that Rescorla Wagner actually captures well how individuals learn linguistic patterns from exposure um, to usage. It's not just the effect of data aggregation, which can give rise to all kinds of averages that aren't actually seen in any single individual. We modeled how individuals would learn from their particular input distribution. And given this, I think we can say that the model can safely be deployed as a model of language learning on a large scale within usage-based theories. We can have confidence that the learning measures we can extract after training the model on a large data set capture something that is important to real language learners too. <clears throat> Now, in a sense, <clears throat> this case study on subject verb agreements in the Polish past tense is an easy case. <clears throat> it's one that can be described by a rule. So what happens if we go to the other extreme? What if we try to model a phenomenon that has defied description by linguists for decades? Can the algorithm learn this too? In fact, can the algorithm help us understand how native speakers deal with this? We're specifically interested to see what cues the model relies on to deal with this phenomenon, because that's the bit that has evaded linguists uh, for many, many decades. Uh, this case study was run again with our former postdoc, Adnan Izizi, and two former PhD students, Jarek Uzefowski and uh, Christian Adam. So you will think I spend my days looking over Polish internet pages to find things that Polish native speakers struggle with. But um, this too is a case that has been discussed um, in, um, in, the Polish, in Polish newspapers. On the 12th of March, 2018, a blog post was posted on the side of a Polish copy editing agency that dealt with the question of the choice of the genitive suffix for masculine inanimate nouns. And in Polish, this group contains nouns for everyday words such as phone and tablet and laptop. And in the case of these words, it's unclear whether the genitive case suffix should be u or a. And you will understand that that is a serious nuisance in the modern world. But the choice of genitive ending was an issue long before the advent of the phone, the tablet, and the laptop. And in fact, in 1956, Westphal published a 350 page monograph on the topic. And as you can see from the first page of his table of contents, the classification he came up with is extremely detailed. Westphal distinguishes several classes and within each class, several groups and within each group, several types. The first group of the first class has separate categories for chess pieces, coins and banknotes, mattresses, crosses, flowers, parts of flowers, whips, and so on. And this goes on for many, many uh, pages just in the table of contents. And it looks like by the end of his book, Westphal's kind of lost the plot too, because he concludes his monograph saying that, you know, overall, who's the, elegant, the elegant option and A uh, is the vulgar one. Um, 
and he's, he was right kind of throwing the towel in the, in the ring because unfortunately, even the most fine-grained semantic um, classifications fail. And my personal favorite is the one that proposes that front parts of the body take A while rear parts take U, which seems to work reasonably well, except for the prototypical front and rear parts, um, the words for bust and bum, Bust and Tivek or Zadek, which take the opposite of what the rule prescribes. And of course, linguists aren't so easily discouraged. In such cases, linguists resort to morphological criteria, which would point out that the suffix ek on the words for bomb, so zadek and tiwak, is in fact a diminutive suffix, which is typically used for animate beings and hence might trigger the a doesn't. And if morphology can't save us, we move down the hierarchy to phonology. But sometimes, these phonetic and morphological and semantic criteria yield contradictory results. And some words can take both endings and so on. So if there seems like there is absolutely nothing to go on, but does that mean that we are at the mercy of case by case memorization? Or is there something that can actually be learned? Um, so we decided to test what really drives the AU allomorphy in masculine inanimate nouns in Polish. And we first conducted a corpus-based study and tested all the properties that had previously been proposed um, in the literature. And Jarek, who is a native speaker of Polish but also a linguist, manually annotated nearly 5,000 different nouns for the following three overarching properties. So phonological properties, it's been found that the ending U is extremely rare with stems in a palatalized consonant, but preferred with nouns that end in certain other consonants or consonant clusters. There are also some morphological properties. Some derivational suffixes are strongly associated with a, and others are strongly associated with u. There are also some um, semantic properties that have to do with the size and the type of the object. It's typically said that a is, is used for movable, small, and easily manipul manipulable items, whereas u prefers the opposite, immovable, large items that are not easily manipulated. So the problem with these variables is that they're either only part of the data can be used or the model that you fit to the data is really poor or both. So for example, when we look at the model for phonological typ typicality, we can see that that variable only applies, only 36% of the total data set could be categorized as phonologically typical for A or U. We have the same with morphological typicality. It's even worse, only 23% of the, of the sample could be categorized as morphologically typical um, or not. And um, the same goes for entity size. 25% of the full sample could be categorized according to um, whether it was immovable or manipulable. And the uh, model fits are also quite poor. The black lines that you see on the plots, they're supposed to coincide with the top of the color bars, not be um, widely off. Um, semantic type didn't really fare much better. It did contribute significantly to explaining the, the choice between A or U, but the model didn't perform well um, because the uh, unaccounted deviance remained significant. And also the results do not really match up with available experimental evidence. So in our model, count did poorly, but mass did reasonably well. But in our experiments with native speakers, Eva Dombrowska found the opposite. She found no evidence for mass or substance and some evidence for count. So none of the properties that linguists have long played with seem to be reliable indicators for the choice. So the question is, is there something else? And can learning help us solve the problem and reveal which cues are important to learn? So we started with a simulation study to see whether the Rescola Wagner model can learn allomorphy, where one ending is slightly more frequent than the other, and a tiny fraction of nouns take both endings. Because when I was learning Polish, it appeared completely unlearnable to me. The training regime that we used for the simulation was as follows. So we had 10 items in total, and we used proportions that we saw on the corpus. So six items uh, always took U, three items always took A, and one item took A, a and both A and U 50% of the time. So the left panel of this graph shows that um, we're looking at the U ending, so the more frequent one that occurred six out of 10 times. 
that against an overall higher background rate of six out of 10, which you can see in a black wiggly line, the six items that always take O are reasonably well associated with O here at about 0 0.4, while the three items that never take O are reasonably well dissociated from O here at minus 0 0.6. The one item that takes both endings here represented by the blue wiggly line um, does not become associated with O. It hovers around zero initially and then becomes um, inhibitory remaining at around minus 0.1. The right panel shows that against an overall lower background rate, a rate of three out of 10, the black wiggly line again, the associations are actually stronger. So the three items that always take A are more strongly associated um, with A at 0.6. Um, then the O-taking items are associated with O that was 0 0.4. And the six items that never take R here at the bottom are less well dissociated from R at minus 0.3 than the R-taking minority is dissociated from O here at minus 0.6. The one item in blue again that takes both endings is associated with R to some extent. It hovers around zero initially, but then goes up to a 0 0.2 association. So in other words, not only are both learning learn and that both are both endings learned to a relatively stable level, 0.4 or 0.6, but the proportion of six O taking and three R taking items appears to create such a learning environment that even a tiny minority alternation can thrive. Like a chance level item will evolve as a weekly negative one for the outcome that is more frequent. Uh, and has more competition among supportive cues, but it will become positive and stabilize as such for the less frequent outcome, where the cohort of cues competing for evidence, positive evidence is smaller. Now, because the simulation results look promising, we embarked on a full-fledged um, learning study. First, we trained a network on sounds. The core components in our learning system are input cues. They are in gray here on the slide and the learning outcomes, which are in orange on the slide. Polish, fortunately, despite all of its complexity, has a relative shallow orthography. So we use three letter combinations as proxies for sounds. And that's why the network is called a grapheme to lexome or a G2L network. Now the relationship between these cues and outcomes is repeatedly updated as experience accumulates. If a given cue is consistently present when an outcome is present, as Tsut is here, um, in the case of Tsuda, their connection is strengthened, it's indicated in red. But if a given cue is repeatedly present when the outcome is absent, as Tsut is in the case of Huga, then the weight on the connection between them is weakened and that is indicated in blue. Over time, some cues become discriminative, predictive for an outcome, while well, many cues become irrelevant and they are indicated here in gray. From this network, different measures can be derived and the one that, we, that will be important for us is diversity, which is a measure of how well the weights of the trigraphs in the visual inputs are spread out over different words. We also train a network on meaning a meaning here is not meaning according to a linguistic semantic classification, but it is based on the distribution of a word across contexts. So the green boxes contain other words in the context um, of the words Tsuda and Puga that are of interest to us. And we see that you can um, investigate miracles, the, the red positive association on the slide, but you do not tend to look at their position. So there are gray or irrelevant associations. Here two different measures can be derived from the network and the one that will be important to us is the prior which tells us how well the semantic system knows our word of interest in advance before encountering it. It's very similar to um, frequency. So when we only look at what things sound like and what they mean we get the following results. So um, when we look at uh, A versus O we see that in the case of an R ending, we are looking at a final sound or trigraph that activates few words. So we could say that these are sounds that are atypical for Polish. Whereas when we look at O, we see that we are dealing with a final trigraph that activates many words. So we could say that this sound is typical for Polish. 
when we look at the meaning, we can see that we get an A uh, um, when the words are poorly represented in experience and are semantically atypical, but we get an U when the words are strongly represented in experience and the words are semantically typical. So when we put um, these things together, we can say that the a ah sound is, an, uh, you know, is, is used when we are dealing with an atypical sound sequence that's poorly entrenched, and we are dealing with an, with an atypical word, whereas u endings are um, encountered in environments that are typical sound sequences in words that are well entrenched and that are semantically also typical. So this kind of explains why Paul Westphal concluded that the U would be the elegant ending and the A would be the rough option. It also explains why the majority of borrowings um, end up in the category of words they take on. Uh, so these are atypical sound sequences for Polish and the words are new, so they are poorly um, entrenched. To confirm our uh, orthographic or morphophonetic finding, we ran an experiment using a nonce word task with about 200 native speakers of Polish. And we used a context that triggers the genitive, in this case, there is no, and asked participants to choose between two possible forms of a non-existing word, one in a and one in u. And we found that the higher diversity of our cues, the less likely respondents were to select a. So our findings were um, confirmed. So the takeaway message here is that if we stay faithful to the experience, different types of patterns emerge that maybe we don't typically consider as linguists. We like our labels and we like our semantic explanations, like uh, semantic, I mean, small, manipulable, and things like that. But um, I think we may have a bit too much of that sometimes in cognitive linguistics, and I like to call this the Mozart problem. Too many notes, my dear Mozart, is what Emperor Joseph II said about Mozart's The Marriage of Figaro, and he suggested just cut a few and it will be perfect. So maybe cutting down on a few meaningful linguistic abstractions is also something that we may need to consider doing to meet the requirements of cognitive commitment. Okay, so now that we've dealt with abstractions that may not look the way we expect them to look, I'm going to move to a case study that shows that the dividing lines between the categories that we operate with may not fall where we expect them to fall either. This case study focuses on the tense aspect system in English, and it was carried out together with our current postdoc on the team, Dr. Laurence Romain, and again, former postdoc, Adnan Isisi. They're both in the audience and still happy to answer questions um, over chat. So when we're talking about time, um, what we wanted to find out is whether all English tense aspect combinations are equally learnable and what cues support those tense aspect combinations. So generally, grammars assume the existence of 12 tense aspect combinations, and these arise from the combination of three tenses and four aspects, as you can see in the table. And two of them, the um, simple past, the present simple and the past simple are shorter than the others. And sure enough, they're also much more frequently used than the other combinations. The present and the past simple together make up more than 80% of all of the examples in the British National Corpus. So there's a clear Zipfian shape to the tense aspect usage distribution. Um, those two most frequently used tense aspect combinations, the present simple and the past simple, it can also be said to express simple relations between event time, speech time, and reference time. So in the present simple, event time, speech time, and reference time coincide. In the past simple, event time and reference time coincide and precede speech time. And we know that there's a relationship between length and complexity with simpler things requiring less encoding. Other tense aspect combinations are more complex in the relationships they express between speech time, event time, and reference time, and they provide 5% or fewer of all examples that we encountered in the British National Corpus. Now, from a cognitive perspective, this isn't surprising. Just think of the working memory load that the sequencing of these components um, imposes. Look at these two sentences from the British National Corpus that express more or less the same thing. So the first one does it with simple past forms. The officers tried to stem the flow of blood, the paramedics arrived and took over. 
And the second one squeezes in a past perfect progressive, which, which requires reversing the order um, of events. Paramedics were at the scene in four minutes of the emergency call and took over from officers who had been trying to stem the flow of blood. So it's no surprise that narrative sequencing is an advanced writing skill and it requires explicit teaching, which is often supported uh, by reading the right kinds of texts. It's not something you easily pick up um, from talking. Um, so to model whether all tense aspect combinations are equally learnable and which cues would support each tense aspect combination, we again trained our computational model NDL. But to make the learning experience of our model as natural as possible, we made sure that it could learn from chunks or n-grams. So we identified um, chunks that ranged from one to four words, and we retained the 10,000 most frequent ones for each length. So examples of uh, one gram are just single words, the past few years, etc. A two gram would be the past or few years, a three gram would be for the past, and then four grams would be something like the past few years. Um, so if we look at the sentence, since then he has managed to remain the spiritual leader of his people, what would be cues and what would be outcomes? The n-grams are the cues, um, then, since, then, he, too, and he, too, etc. as is the lexeme managed here in green on the right-hand side. Um, we included the lexeme because we thought it would be unfair on the model to have to predict what the speaker is going to say rather than only how they were going to say it. And the tense aspect labels here at the top, the past simple, the present perfect, those are the outcomes. And the algorithm then figures out which cues are good predictors for the outcomes, given the way in which they co-occur, and it adjusts the strength or the weights of the relation given the errors it makes. The setup of the study is typical for any machine learning study. 90% of the data was kept for training, 5% for validation, and 5% for testing. So that meant that we had over 6 million training events about 350,000 um, testing events. We had 44,000 cues, so the n-grams and the um, infinitives of the lexemes, and we had 11 outcomes. We had to remove the future perfect progressive because it was so rare. I think it only compared a couple of times in the corpus and not enough data to um, learn from. Overall, the prediction accuracy of our model is 67%. That means that in 67% of all cases, the algorithm was able to retrieve the tense aspect combination that was originally used in the BNC sentence. On an 11-way choice, which is what we were facing here, chance level would be 9%. So achieving 67% is, you know, does a lot better. But of course, there's a but, as you can see, the bulk of the correct predictions are made for the present simple and the past simple. Learning follows by and large the natural frequency distribution. Things that occur more frequently are learned better, but this is not the same as saying that everything is frequency driven. So there is no correlation between the frequencies of Q outcome co-occurrence and association strength of weights between Qs and outcomes. So in other words, it's not because things occur frequently together that they also become strongly associated. But what role does frequency play in learnability then? So to explore the effect of the frequency skew on learning further, we simulated NDL on a balanced data set that contained the same number of events per tense aspect label. Um, to achieve this, we had to get rid of more tense aspect combinations. We could only retain the seven most frequent ones, and they were each represented by uh, just over 100,000 events. Now, what is interesting is that the model now underperforms on the present simple. It gets only 34% uh, correct, and especially on the past simple where it falls um, below chance. But also, the overall test accuracy on the balanced set with the best parameters reached only 41% instead of 67%. So things aren't as learnable if all outcomes are equally frequent. And this is something that Adele Goldberg and Nick Ellis have also found in their work on construction learning in L1 and L2 respectively. A Zipfian distribution is preferred where a few verbs make up the bulk of the data for a construction. But why are the simple present and past especially hard to learn without their frequency advantage? 
Let's have a look at the cues that drive our findings. So when we look under the hood, we see that there is a clear split. The present simple and the past simple are strongly supported by the lexical items themselves. There are verbs that are very strongly associated with the present simple and um, the past simple, like he replied, he whispered, he murmured, he nodded. You feel the written character of the B and C here in this. But other tense aspect combinations, such as the present perfect and the future simple, are strongly driven by engrams such as um, we already, I already, since then, uh, traditionally, over the last, um, etc. Um, now this chart contains the distribution of each Q type, contextual engrams versus lexical elements, in the top 100 Qs for each tense aspect combination based on the skewed naturalistic sample. And when we look at the distribution of the Q types over the tense aspect combinations, we see that relatively speaking, the present simple and the past simple rely on lexical cues in bright pink, while the other tenses are supported by engrams in any of the other colors. And when we do the same for our balance sample, where we equalize the frequencies for training, we get different results. All tense aspect combinations have some lexical support and some engram support, but mostly um, and gram support. So it seems to be the case that the frequency with which the tense aspect combinations occur decides what type of cue can come out tops. So frequency of occurrence and the Zipfian distribution of the tense aspect combinations in the input plays a crucial role in the cue outcome dynamics. Because our lexical inventory is finite, verbs will have to be repeated once the tense aspect combination becomes frequent. So Tense aspect combinations that occur less often than there are verbs in the input, input are cued by engrams, but tense aspect combinations that occur overwhelmingly more often than there are verbs in the input are cued by their own lexemes. For example, the present simple and the past simple here at the top are instantiated by more than 3000 different verb types and those verb types are repeated many times about you know, yielding 150,000 tokens. And there's also a mid layer of um, tense aspect combinations that have between 1,000 and 1,500 types, but they are each only repeated five to 10 types, times. And then there is a bottom layer of very rare tense aspect combinations where we are down to a few hundred types that each occur only once or twice. So the present simple and past simple are very frequent. They reflect temporal arrangements that are easy to conceptualize for a number of reasons. And important here is that because of the frequency with which these tense aspect combinations are used, lexical cues can come out strong. So the number of times we use these tense aspect combinations far exceeds the number of lexi lexical items we have at our disposal, so the lexical items have to be repeated. In a sense, everything conspires for us to learn these simple tense aspect combinations really easily. They're frequently used and they have clear and simple lexical cues. Other tense aspect combinations reflect temporal arrangements that are difficult to conceptualize for a number of reasons, and this situation creates a bit of a vicious circle. So complex tense aspect combinations are used less because they're cognitively demanding, but because they are rare, they're also harder to learn. It takes much longer to build up evidence of rare structures. And when they are rare, there are plenty of verbs to go around. So verbs are not repeated and do not come out as strong cues. In instead, the contextual engrams are the more stable elements, but these are compound cues that are harder to track and learn. So in a sense, everything conspires against learning these complex tense aspect combinations. They are rarely used and they have fuzzy complex cues. So if we stay faithful to the linguistic experience, we find different dividing lines. We do find evidence of two subsystems, but they're not tense and aspect. They are simplex and complex, and they are supported by a different type of cue, lexical versus contextual. And on this lexical note, I will wrap up. In a sense, these case studies present a case against too rigid an interpretation of structure or grammar. The patterns language users detect may not look the way we linguists expect the patterns to look, but maybe that's what happens when we let learning play a role in shaping the system. And if we learn from data that is as raw as possible, not enriched by any abstract 
linguistic um, notions. And um, this is something we usage-based linguists might want to consider doing more of if we want to demystify how structure emerges from exposure to usage. I think that this kind of approach may provide valuable insights into the kinds of generalizations or abstractions that can lay claim to cognitive plausibility, and it may ultimately also change the way in which we think about language. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dagmar. Great, thank you very much, that was great. We, I think we all really enjoyed that. Um, first off, I'm really sorry about the bombing there. I, I didn't see what was happening while I was in intro. So we did have a bit of a Zoom bomber. I guess we won't be, I guess we won't be sharing that Zoom link on Twitter a few minutes before in the future. Um, anyway, but thank you and thanks Matt for, for clearing that person out. Um, anyway, um, I think maybe we could jump in with, before we get into the panel, there, there's been sort of a running chat you probably haven't seen. It's probably, and maybe no, a lot no. of the audience hasn't seen it either. So. It was largely about, um, or, or at least the kind of end of it here was about the, um, well, people were surprised by the simple present being so common in the BNC. Um, and your colleagues have been, have been assuring us that it was carefully hand checked. So maybe there's something said about that. And also maybe about the, the, the other kind of related question was what part of the BNC is being looked at? I gather it's all of it. Um, but I guess just if there's anything there you might want to add in on. Yeah, well, I will hand over to Admiral and Laurence, but one of the things I would like to stress is that we didn't, we were really very, very careful in annotating the uh, tense aspect combinations. And in addition to what the BNC provided, I think Laurence and Adnan, between the, two, be, between the two of them, created another 50 um, sub rules to make sure we didn't, we didn't, our annotation wasn't, I mean, wasn't too far off the mark. And um, a check showed that um, a manual check showed that we had 96% accuracy in annotating the tense aspect um, combinations. Just using the, the raw annotation from the BNC gave a much lower um, accuracy score. Oh, and before we open up to the panel, can I also ask people to move the questions if possible into the question and answer box? You have, you have both a chat and you should also have a Q&A box there that's available to you. And if you go to the Q&A box and you can upvote other people's questions so we can kind of, it's often too many to handle. So if people upvote them, then we can um, sort of filter them that way. I'll, I'll also take a look at YouTube as well. So if people want to post questions there. Um, otherwise, can we open it up to the panel, please? Oh, sorry, David, thank you. Thanks very much, Dagmar. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, I, I think that the analysis you gave of the genitive singular al alamorphy looks great. It looks like it works really, really well. But I was kind of interested then in, if that is the etiology of the variation there, that it's fundamentally not about an abstract linguistic category, but about two interacting factors of surface form and then Kind of semantic vectors, right? Yeah, yeah. So what happens when you don't have that kind of thing happening, right? So if we have the allomorphy being conditioned by animacy, or, you know, like, just like every other language, I'm, I'm exaggerating, right? But like most cases of allomorphy we see in most languages, how do you get from surface form and semantic vector to totally conditioned by, you know, animate singular third declension or something, right? So I guess that was my question, like, what's the pathway from the learning to the abstraction? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question, David. Um, in a sense, it's similar to what, what what we showed in the first case study, where you could also say, you know, the rule is simple. If it's if it's masculine um, human, there is a clear rule that says the ending should be Lee. If it is anything else, there is a clear rule that says the ending should be Wei. Right? Um, our participants learned that, and um, I think Adnan may want to say more about that. He he did a an exit interview with them, and some of them were able to say that whenever there was a male um, person in the scene, they would use a specific ending. But not everybody was able to to verbalize that, although they were able to do the thing correctly. So I think this is you know within usage based 
linguistics, we kind of acknowledge that things can exist simultaneously at different levels of abstraction at the very low level that was illustrated here. And things can also uh, start to exist at the more abstract level, but we don't assume that every individual speaker will make the same abstractions. Um, so that's something we're really interested in to see um, which speakers make those abstractions, what abstractions those speakers actually make we, to, to really chart the trajectory from this low level input to, to the higher level abstractions. But I think, yeah, they can coexist and you don't need the higher one to, to, to be able to behave according to the lower one. Maybe Petter wants to add something? I mean, on the technical side or from the technical perspective, well, uh, you know, what we did in, 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 in other studies is also to look uh, uh, similarity as expressed in, 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 the, in the learning network. So you train your corpus, you, you use Riscola Wagner rule, and then in the end you have some structure which is expressed by the many learning weights. And then if you, if you look at them, if you, if, you, if you try to see how similar are two words or how they group, then you can see some kind of emergence of, 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 of those abstractions at different levels. So you can pick up on, on those from the structure of what is learned in the network. That's not necessarily defined as a unit or as a thing, but it, it kind of lives between those discrimination weights. Mm -hmm. I, hope I, mean, that I find this really interesting. I mean, I, I think that, you know, I mean, I think that analysis you give of the Bosch thing is quite, it's quite compelling, but I still am finding, and, and I'm, I hear what you're saying about abstractions living at different levels. Um, I'm just kind of intrigued as to, you know, I mean, I mean, why is that languages generally kind of land in the same places? Right, you know, why animacy is a conditioner of allomorphy quite frequently, you know, what, why the typology works out as it does, when really, you know, what your, what your, what your, the low level stuff doesn't have that in it. So it's that pathway that I'm kind of really intrigued by how to get, you know, why do you land where, you, why do languages land where they land? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, in, if if you want to, you can you can feed the algorithm different types of information, right? I mean, if you say, for example, it's visual learning, um, you could it, it it can have a category of, or it can have a concept of mass of of something that's animate or that's inanimate. What we have done here is really only go on the on the raw linguistic yeah, input, but we you know you it it can learn these things. The question then is. Um, whether we can show, then the, then the challenge becomes to show how do people learn that something is animate, for example, before we would accept that the category of animacy plays a role, we would first want to show that actually this is how human beings learn. We know that human beings know what an animate being is and what is not, what not, what, what isn't. But in essence, that is how, how we would want to proceed. So we would want to show that they, they have these categories before we allow the model to, to, to rely on those. And that very last, comment because that leads on to the I mean the question like in your first study the Lee one past tense um I mean so did I, I just didn't get this um this is connected to the point you just made so when you did the test and you looked at new combinations did you also look at cases which were just outside of the experience so like you know masculine ma like I'm, I'm thinking of two cases one is masculine animate, animates, you know, Varel or whatever they're called, um, that were not in the input at all. So did the learning algorithm learn, you know, it's just a word that wasn't in the input, but that was, quotes, Varel. And then what happens in cases, this is just an interesting question to me, what happens in cases where you play around with the speaker's knowledge which may not be uh, total of the masculine masculine animacy of one of the individuals in the combination. So imagine you kind of have, uh, you know, you have, I, I'm 
thinking of like, you know, Putnam and cats and stuff, but like, imagine you have a robot who then turns out to be a real masculine human or so, you know, something like that, right? So like, you know, those cases which are not in the training set weren't in the, what happened, do, does the algorithm learn the concept of virile or does it just learn that once you've got one of those words that's in that situation, it better use Lee? Okay, I, I can, um, Jack, can you unmute um, Adnan because he knows the training and the test data set. Yes, I don't but it, it strikes me that that's crucial, right? Like you do yeah. go into the training data, so then there is this kind of, um, you know, that that's the place where that gets tested out to some extent at least. Okay, um, Adnan, I think this is the first time we, we, we've done this, so I think it's going to work. Oh no, sorry, I maybe did somebody wrong. Hold on, so, sorry, things move around here, a lot of talk, okay. Hi, Adam, that should work for you. Hello, everyone. Can you yes. hear me now? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. so that, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, actually, like uh, as Dagmar said in, in the talk, we, we try to mimic how, uh, how uh, like uh, the subjects in, in the experiment learn. So we restricted like the learning to just the items that were presented in the experiment. So we haven't looked at what happens in the, in the corpus, for example. Yeah just what, what the learning items were uh, that were presented to, to the participants. Okay, well, great, thanks. If, if I can just uh, jump in, um, just to try to, to clarify, I think that NDL was surprisingly successful in all kinds of comprehension uh, tasks, so to say. But this, the, if I understand your question correctly, this is almost at the verge of, of, of production question, right? Or unseen, to predict unseen form or something like that. I think that uh, a lot of work currently in, in Tubingen group uh, uh, with, with Harold Bein is actually focusing on, on how to actually make a, a, a more powerful sy sim system that will do both things. For now, I think that what we did in particular was on, on comprehension side. I'm not saying that it's impossible. I, I have, I mean, we discussed so many times about what could be done in that that department, but for now I would say this is this is the this is how far NDL should proven to be uh, um, successful. Yeah, that seems, yeah, that's really interesting. Can we open up the floor to does it um do any of our guest panelists uh, uh, like jump in Adele, I see your mic's off, but that might not be a signal. Oh uh Oh, it wasn't. It wasn't actually a single, but um, signal. But um, I, I, I will say I, I totally enjoyed this talk. I, there, it's it's fascinating work, and I would love to understand the modeling and better. Um, so it seems to me that this idea of clustering is really important, and I, I really appreciated your emphasis on memory. I think memory is where what we need to understand better. We know that we don't learn like unordered or we don't learn ordered lists, you know, our knowledge isn't at all like a hardware store. Um, it, it's, it's a web of knowledge, it's a network. Um, so it, it seems to me that it, it shouldn't be that hard to generalize because if you have a communicative demand that the generalization would be based on the closest cluster to expressing that, the function that you intend, um, so I'm, I'm kind of surprised that that requires a big leap. I, I, it, I'm just missing something in my understanding of how the model works, I think. Thank you. But you mean, uh, technically, it would require a big leap. I mean, yeah, that, that's, that's sometimes a problem with wanting to do something computationally and wanting to be able to make every step explicit, that what for us is like a small step actually technically would be quite a big leap and you would need to build a new module on top of um, the thing that you currently have. So um, as, as Peter said, you know, you have the matrix and you can derive weights from that, but then you start doing all kinds of things for which we don't have any proof that they are cognitively plausible. Um, I mean, we've we also talked about this diversity and prior, and these are kind of, you know, mathematical operations that you carry out on the information that you have learned. 
but then we move away from our cognitive plausibility requirement. I mean, technically it's possible, mathematically it's possible, but are we still doing things then in a way that we know this, this is how it happens um, in, in animals or humans or, or other learning systems as well. So that's where we are a bit hesitant um, to proceed. Um, so is, is there a paper that you could recommend um, that compares this kind of model with, with a connections model or transformer model? Because it, it, it looked similar and, you know, the transformer models can capture aspects of, you know, hierarchy um, and connections models, of course, can generalize. So I'm, mm -hmm. is, there, is there work that compares those? Yeah, I, I mean, we can send you some. Um, okay, but maybe Peter wants to elaborate on that aspect. Well, yeah. Uh, so specifically, we did a couple of studies where we compared memory-based learning with uh, naive discrimination learning, mm -hmm. because that's where kind of our interest were sitting. Uh, the, computationally, my concern is that it can as you said, maybe that's not a big leap, but conceptually it might be a big leap when you assume that there is some kind of high level sophisticated knowledge, which you feed to the system for free. But then the question is coming back, okay, how that came about in the first place in, in, in human, in, in user, language language users. So that's the problem where we would like to, to stay very careful about but, but making you know, such assumptions. But but uh -huh. if you're assuming things like animate, like the recognition and interest in animacy or movement, like you know, there's tons of evidence that infants are already interested in that. So I, I would feel happy, easy assuming that kind that level of you know knowledge. Yeah, well, we did also that as well because we learned top down from from behavioral profiles to um to lexical level so to say both top down and 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 and, and bottom up and we saw that actually those information are kind of both predictive but in different ways for for behavioral measures um so we are not avoiding these kind of uh, things mm -hmm. um it's it's kind of you know with connection is it's I, I can say well yes in principle technically speaking ndl or Escola Wagner or Bidruf Hoch, which is kind of original Delta rule, is actually at the core of, of any connectionist model, minus feedback, which we don't have. And it's also kind of there, there's a lots of argumentation that that actually cannot be biologically plausible. So there are people who are kind okay. of arguing bitterly right. about that. Well, the, the transformer models don't have feedback now either. Yeah. They're for feed forward. Yeah, sure. And I said, this is just, uh, I don't know, Vidrup did this uh, deep or, or hierarchical uh, uh, simple delta uh, machines uh, and, and long ago, I mean, in 60s. And this is essentially a feed forward uh, a network. And he saw that it works pretty fine. We are keeping close to what is motivated in, in also in psychological experimentation. So you have this Riscola of Wagner, which is notoriously well known that it fits a lot of experimental results. Although it's also known that it has specific limits. Thank you. Um, Jeanette, do you want to jump in? I see you turn off your mic, or turn on your mic. Yeah, I, I, um, I wanted to follow up thing from, from, from Adele's point because I was thinking about uh, the tendency in, in children to over animate things and also to personify uh, in, in, in uh, animate objects. So kind of to move everything kind of up the hierarchy in a way. And, and I was wondering whether it'd be interesting to look at child directed speech um, in, in people and the endings that people are using in, in Polish in relation to that, to see whether that's kind of a part of the learning mechanism to kind of like over generalize the animacy. Um, seeing as it's about, you know, language acquisition, I was wondering whether that might be a, an interesting thing to look at. Yeah, I mean, the reason why we didn't include these properties here is because the initial corpus study showed that they don't, um, they don't apply. I mean, they only apply to at least, I mean, max one third of the data and then the models really aren't very good. But as, as Petra mentioned, we have worked with more abstract labels like um, has something already happened which then would be past tense or is something animate or 
is it you know is it um, an agent or a patient or things like that and and yeah as when you give the model that information it learns it learns really really well from that it's just that this particular phenomenon we knew from the start that none of these things worked mm -hmm. um, so we we were desperate for the model to maybe show us something else that um, that could explain why native speakers learn this and then that it is actual learning and not just case by case memorization. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Martin, Ted, do you guys have any, you want to jump in? I can also take questions from the floor or from Bodo and Adam as well. Martin, please. Um, yeah, I have a more general uh, question. Uh, you um, mentioned several times that you are usage-based linguists, that you're doing sort of usage-based linguistics. Um, you said we usage-based linguists, and you know, I'm not quite sure what it means to be a usage-based linguist, whether we need this kind of identity. I was also a bit worried when you mentioned uh, Lakoff's cognitive commitment, because somehow, you know, we don't want to have commitments in science. We want to sort of ask questions without any commitments. So, so you know, what would be different uh, if you weren't a usage-based uh, linguist? That wasn't clear to me. I mean, for, for me, it was far too technical. I'm a typologist um, and a descriptive linguist. So, but I was- Well, you're, you're, you're usage-based. <laughs> I, 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 I had a paper where I used that term, but then I, I became unsure. Um, and uh, I, you know, especially since David is also here and so on, and you know, how can we sort of all come together and kind of not have these labels? So, so I'm, I was asking myself, for example, what would Charles Yang do, right? He's sort of a well-known, uh, you know, learning specialist who is kind of not using this usage-based label. So, so what is specific uh, to the usage-based approach here? So, I, well, I think I don't think to begin with, I don't think necessarily labels are bad. For example, I really liked in David's talk last week that he is clear about what um, his hypothesis is and how he's going to go about uh, testing that, although the model is very different from what I would um, I would adopt. So I don't think I think generally there has been the case that usage based linguistics has been applied very widely um, to anyone who who looks at usage and I don't think that's um, how it's intended. I mean, there is a very specific definition of usage-based linguistics as acknowledging that a system, the language system emerges from use and is shaped by use with the influence of certain cognitive, um, um, human cognitive abilities. Um, if I wouldn't be a usage-based linguist, um, I wouldn't necessarily start bottom up. So I wouldn't necessarily start from raw corpus data. I could use um, syntactically enriched uh, corpus data or semantically enriched corpus data. And if I wouldn't be a cognitive linguist, I wouldn't be so concerned with doing or using technical um, interventions that have no basis in, um, in learning or in cognition. So in a sense, I would have a much wider range of tools at my um, disposition. Would anyone else like to follow up on that? Um, comments on that point? I would say the, the kind of commitment doesn't, doesn't um, it, it's, not an, it's not an assumption, it's a, it's a choice. Like we want, to, we want to explain what, how speakers think. And if you don't want it, if you're not interested in that, that's fine. But by saying, by, by saying you adopt a cognitive commitment, it, it's just a focus of, interest yeah yeah and i assume you can be usage based and not like don't take the cognitive commitment like i think probably i do maybe so maybe call well. it maybe call it the cognitive goals then you know because if we differ in goals that's sort of clear mm -hmm. um but you know commitment yeah, yeah. that was I, kind of kind <laughs> of goal <laughs> yeah like that. mm. Well, that's yeah, how it was always... called in the original c contribution which is why i cited it um like that but yeah. I've, I've always been interested in the question of with, with, within this cognitive commitment type approach, like, I mean, which psychology are we committed to, right? I mean, there's a massive range of different psychological theories about all sorts of aspects of how, I mean, of how our cognitive systems work and psychology, 
I don't know whether Martin would agree with me here. Psychology seems to me in some places to be behind linguistics in our understanding of stuff. And sure, in other places, it's a much bigger set of issues, right? In other places, far more advanced. But, you know, I, I'm never quite sure about, you know, about for when we're thinking about language, about whether the theories of cognition that are appealed to to do certain kinds of things in, in language and in cognitive grammar or whatever, how do we know those are right? Why do we give them epistemological priority over, ah, look at this lovely syntactic pattern that I know is there and I can like then test and see what that's doing. So that's always been my, I mean, I, you know, I love looking at Susan Carey's work or, you know, or whoever, right? You know, there's lots of really interesting psychology that you can get inspiration from, but I'm just a bit wary about taking on theoretical commitments from psychology wholesale. That's my concern. It's not a concern, it's, it's a way of thinking, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, there's certainly no one approach that, I mean, I guess we're all, to go back to the metaphor of the element, we're all like the blind, touching different parts of the element, trying to figure out what the thing is. And that's, to me, how we are all approaching language. And I think no one approach will have the ultimate answer. Totally all approaches, if done conscientiously, will hopefully contribute an important you know, part, answer an important part of the puzzle. So um, I think any approach that tries to be um, rigorous um, is worth is worth considering. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, can I? I, I ask, just ask a question. I, I don't know what this. I don't know this term. I don't actually know what cognitive commitment means. So what? What does? Uh, what did Lakoff or whoever or whoever is using it now mean by? I actually don't know what is meant by that. Can so someone elaborate already- what? Pardon? Sorry. Yes, yeah, go ahead, okay. please. So in the original publication, the cognitive commitment referred to the commitment of cognitive linguists to explain um, language in terms of what is known about the mind and the brain from other disciplines. That it should be consistent with that. So I, I guess that's why when you're talking about the models and, 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 and Adele's question, like these are relevant questions if you subscribe to the cognitive commitment, but perhaps if you subscribe to like the most elegant or efficient or whatever, then you don't necessarily have to go down that road. That's that's the difference. And I think, I assume like, for example, that like, you know, maybe that's less important to someone both in minimalism, but also less important to somebody who is say, just like a descriptive lingua. Uh, well, not, I, I don't mean to say just one, cause I consider myself <laughs> one as well, but like, but like Martin, right? Like maybe we don't have, maybe we don't need to, to have that commitment. Um, uh, well, you will have least that's what my understanding. Right, in typology, oh, you will have no, different- I was just gonna- I was just going to say in reference to that point about the brain, uh, I used to work at University College London where there are lots of neuroscientists and they said to me, we can never solve your disagreements in linguistics, that what we know about the brain is a very, is very, very rough. And, um, uh, you know, functional MRIs won't answer your linguistic uh, theoretical questions. Um, And I've always carried that with me. I think a lot of linguists do bring in evidence from neuroscience, for example, and, and and they try and blind you with the science, I think, and say, look, this is what this shows, you know, the N400, blah, blah, blah. And it's, yeah, I, I, I do feel that David is right, that sometimes it's linguists who know more about this stuff than, than uh, in the, you know, related um, sciences. I would say well, that- I mean, I would just say it's an empirical question. So these are all empirical questions. I, 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 don't quite agree with your characterization, Adam. I think the brain can tell us a lot about uh, language. And so, I, I mean, for instance, my favorite example is, um, well, of, of someone doing research is at Fedorenko's work, who, who's, who's showing that, has shown very, I think, convincingly that the brain networks which are doing language are completely separate from brain lang- from the brain networks that are doing anything else. And so that, that doesn't, I mean, they're that doesn't mean they're innate. So that doesn't answer the question of where they're coming from. And, uh, oh, go ahead. How do they define language though? Because it often seems to me they're talking about morphosyntax when they say <laughs> what's language and they're leaving out things like prosody. They're leaving out things like, I mean, so I, 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 I that's the problem. It seems to me that every time I, I, I know the work that you're referring to, yeah. and it yeah. seems to be, have a very narrow idea of what language is. 
I don't think it's very narrow. I, I, I would disagree with you. It's, it's basically language minus anything else uh, and so you're you, you're talking about what the baseline is and so but i mean is like so if you do language minus non-words if you do language just minus like so it's like trying to localize whatever it is we're doing when we're doing this task right now you're listening to me talk presumably you're understanding something about what it i'm what i'm saying and and you can compare that to just doing nothing you can find it or or compare it to you know, some maybe a foreign language, you know, so you don't understand or foreign language you don't understand. And uh, you'll find activation. This is like as opposed to speech specific um, networks, which will the which will be in the, you know, um, auditory cortex, so not, not in there, but in high level languages, you'll get I mean, it's an interesting question when you're talking about what what aspects of uh, of um, uh, intonation and prosody are in there. And I think there's there are lots in there, probably. But I, I mean, so I think this can inform our theories of language, of, of linguistics, you know, that uh, that it does look like in in her work that there is a and it's a you know really robust that it's a very distinct network that is doing this that is and there's and there's no other tasks that do that that tax that network at all. I mean, I don't know how that addresses these questions at all. I think you know maybe the same learning that goes on in other networks. It doesn't say that. You know, it, it, it's not like, um, you know, that network probably can develop differently um, depending on the environment, depending on what the experience is. And, and uh, uh, um, so um, anyway, I, I'm not really sure how this gets back to the original question, which is uh, well, what I want to know, which, which is the what is the what is the commitment, the cognitive commitment? I'm sort of like an empiricist commitment. <laughs> it's like I want to know how these things are implemented in the mind and brain. And so I'm using the brain is pretty good evidence that there's like some domain specific network doing this task. Uh, and so I kind of want to use that, I guess, as uh, to an extent I, I can. And that's, you know, it's not the same as thinking. Anyway, so uh, anyway, yeah. anyway, um, can I ask a question to Dagmar about something else? Yes, please, please. please. <laughs> it was a lovely talk, by the way. Um, um, yeah, I actually had questions sort of similar to um, Adele's in a way, and and I, you know, so my question initially was like just trying to understand how the models that you are testing, so you and and Petra or whoever are testing are um, different from other models, and I'm a little naive naive here, and so like which which models are you showing or are you know you're using Riskler Wagner there, and is that how does that uh, falsify some other ways of thinking about learning? And, and I, I guess another thing I wanted to like, so if you could say a few words about that, and then also how does it, does it extend to, for instance, le learning things like word order? Is that like, or you know, and, and multiple, I don't know, sort of compositionality kind of questions. Can you, you do that? Do you have any, anything to general, sort of generalize to other kinds of problems? Because you're kind of doing neat, hard problems within uh, morphosyntax in a way, but how do those extend? I mean, it seems like it makes me think about how to extend those to you know, uh, other harder problems. I wonder if you could elaborate on that a little. Okay, yeah, I'll start and then I'll hand over to Peter. So we started with the Skorla Wagner model because this is basically the simplest thing you can do when we wanted to see how far you can get with the simplest thing, because, you know, there are bells and whistle models uh, around currently that will do that will do anything, but you just don't understand what's going on. So we wanted to start from the other end and start as, as simply as possible and then build on that. Um, so the, the, the Rescorda Wagner model is the one that's ready that, that has been used um, in, in lots of settings. But of course, you know, one of the things we're looking at is extending it, giving it some memory, giving it some attention, see how that changes, how it engages with the input it receives, because those are also, you know, interesting things that usage, usage based linguists are, uh, are interested in. Um, Peter, do you want to take over for the? Well, just, just to add a little bit, there's, I mean, there's, plenty to, to, to say about this, but this is just the, 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 the idea to, let's say, invest as little as possible with not, without immediate idea to refute anything else. But this is just the cheapest algorithm and very careful, very naive input and output without adding too much to that is the way to, if you want to commit to anything to build things uh, from 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 uh, let's say bottom up. Mm -hmm. um, We've been. That's, that's the, we are also playing with other 
close relatives to Ris a bit more powerful uh, than Riscola Wagner, but uh, from from um, mathematical point of view or, or, or from the point of view of algorithm, though those are very similar. You can call them relatives, mm -hmm. and and they are all. Um, at, at one level or another, argue that they're biologically plausible. Yeah. So people who are doing this kind of work are claiming that there is a, there is a, um, there is this this important aspect of, of of how those machines or or those algorithms learn. I'm really still surprised and trying to digest your point that there is anything in the brain that is so distinctive from anything else in 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 functioning sense. I. I know a bit of the work that you're referring to, but I think that brain is really very messy thing and there is nothing particularly distinctive. So I, I, I kind of, I'm still kind of digesting this point that you tried to make. I think that, that it's- uh... well, I, I didn't give you any evidence. I just <laughs> told you that it was true, right? Yeah. And so you would have to evaluate the evidence. I mean, that's like a whole other presentation. You should really get Ev Fedorenko to do that. I mean, I could probably do it, but you should get her to do it. And there's like, a, this really kind of overwhelming how, I, I mean, I'm very convinced by how distinct the language network is in every, you know, in every person from every, from any other task you can, make up it's kind of remarkable how i think just to add though but it doesn't tell us how it got there and i think not at all not at all my god no 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 there's nothing about learning here this is about the end result and the result in, would like that and Ted, yeah. i mean she she doesn't claim that it, it originates there or it has to be there and we know it doesn't no. because blind people have part of the network in their occipital cortex and absolutely just it doesn't claim that it's modular right that that the language network doesn't immediately automatically interface with other parts of the brain and we know it does so no 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 i mean i i take it as as a given that modularity is not the same as innate they are entirely different things right. we have a visual word form area every person who reads is a visual word form area it's yeah. obviously not innate it's like and it develops in the same person in, in the same place in every person approximately that is learned you're learning to read you know it's you know it's not anything to do with um, you know, it can't. It's not innate. It's uh, didn't, didn't we put a uh, kind of ban on innate earlier on? You know? <laughs> After last week, I think. I think that oh, it's, really, it's really interesting. Maybe we'll have to get Evan for for Birmingham Birmingham lectures part two. Yeah, we can get I right into that. We can, to we can get back in. to to Tad's question about other models that we are trying to refute. So we've not. Um, we're working on attention models and memory models, but what we've been focusing on so far is things like memory-based learning, which is another model that, that's quite popular in usage-based linguistics. And so we've compared how this model compares to what we can do with memory-based learning. And we've generally found that although this model is much simpler and we feed it much simpler, much more raw uh, information, it actually performs better than um, the memory-based learners. So that's our, our, our attention has gone in, in that direction, so to speak, rather than into the direction of other models that are specifically developed for learning with no direct application to language. If, if I, I'd, I'd love to know I, what you mean by memory-based model. The memory-based learner, the Tilburg Timble, for example? For example. Okay. Hey, I'm sorry. I think we have to cut this discussion short. It's been really a fun one today. I'm really sorry to the audience for not getting into those questions. Um, I'll, I'll do what I did last week, in which is I will send the, uh, uh, an image of the of, of the unanswered questions, which is all of them, I suppose. Yeah, <laughs> in, I in, in but I'll send them on to Dagmar and, 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 and Peter, and they can um, answer those on Twitter, I think. I mean, I know a lot of you aren't on Twitter, but if you go check out Dagmar and, and Peter's uh, web, uh, Twitter accounts, I mean, they're easy to find. Just search Google on them. Um, you'll find the answers there. Is, is that okay? And we can maybe pick up some of these points next week. Um, it was a really great conversation this time. Um, I'm really looking forward to next week as well. Let me just give a plug for that first. So, so we'll have Martin Hasselmath here wrapping us up. This is the final one of our series. Um, his talk is called Explaining Diverse Language Structures from Convergent Evolution of Linguistic Conventions. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. I think we're going to get another perspective here. And um, I think it'll be a great way to wrap up. Um, so I'd love to thank everyone for coming again today. This is really nice. Great to see you all here again. Uh, I really appreciate all the panelists uh, showing up and engaging with this. And it's been a really good discussion. I mean, I think as people said last week, it's really nice just to see um, all these different perspectives coming together and being discussed in a really open and 
positive and and um, and, and 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 accepting way. So it's really nice to see that. Um, I look forward to see you guys all next week. Thank you very much. Um, and, um, and, and look out on Twitter for answers. Thank you guys. See you next week. Bye. 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 Thanks, Dagmar. Thanks, Dagmar. Thanks, Dagmar. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, guys. Yeah.